What's up Lazy Dog fam? Hope everybody out there is having a wonderful day. Today on the homestead, we're going to be checking on our seedlings in the greenhouse, getting some more seeds started, and then we're going to go out to the garden and work on getting a plot ready for spring planting. We're going to put down a bunch of alfalfa pellets that we're doing as a test to kind of compare that to our composted plots. But before we do that, I want to talk about something that's going on around here that happens every year right around this time. So gardeners all over the country and the world for that matter use different cues to help them remember when they need to plant something or when they need to get the ground ready or whatever. For instance around here everybody uses Valentine's Day as kind of a reminder when to plant potatoes. You know anytime between Valentine's Day and the end of February is ideal tater time around here. Other people use St. Patrick's Day as a reminder when to plant certain things. So we won't be planting these taters here till mid to late February, but we're fortunate to have a nice little reminder of when to start getting our tater plot ready. It reminds us, hey, you probably need to go ahead and get your soil ready because it's gonna be tater time before long. And that reminder for us comes in the form of a band of traveling con men that like to visit South Georgia every year around this time and take advantage of the fine folks of South Georgia by doing some lackluster painting jobs, roof repair jobs. And this year, it seems that the asphalt paving is their trickery of choice. Now in the past, I've gotten in trouble for using the G word to refer to these type of people. And if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, that word, it starts with a G and ends with an Ipsy. But these people come down here right around the beginning of February, like clockwork, every year. I was riding down the road the other day, two days ago, late in the evening, and saw they had already got somebody, not two miles from our house there, paving somebody's driveway with asphalt, putting it down about an inch thick, and I wanted to stop and tell the people that they had been got, but it was too late. So what their scheme is, they'll come around here, tell you they got a little bit of asphalt left from a previous job, and they're gonna cut you a deal on paving your driveway. And then they'll proceed to put asphalt just on straight sand with minimal dirt work, put it down about an inch or so thick. Sometimes they don't even finish the entire driveway. And then you've got an asphalt job that's gonna crack and cave in probably within a year or so and end up looking like straight crud before too long. Now they stop by our house every single year and I run them off, I know the drill, I'm not falling for it, but sadly, a lot of people around here do fall for it and get taken advantage of. And while I don't appreciate them taking advantage of the fine folks of South Georgia, I do appreciate the reminder to get my tater dirt ready. So in just a couple weeks, it will indeed be tater time. And if you hadn't got your seed potatoes yet, our good friends over at Wood Prairie Farm have a nice selection of seed potatoes. These are organically grown seed potatoes. The advantage to buying from these guys is they're the grower themselves. A lot of times you buy seed potatoes online, you're buying it through a distributor, you're not buying it directly from the grower. These guys grow these potatoes that are in this bag right here and they're organically certified. So if you haven't gotten your seed potatoes yet or you want to try some new varieties that you've never tried before, go to their website, woodprairie.com. Use the code LAZYDOGFARM to get 5% off on your order and you can specify your ship date. If it's going to be a while before you can plant potatoes, you can tell them exactly when you want them to ship them to you. That way you'll have them in time to plant. All right, so now let's go in the greenhouse here and see how our seedlings are doing. So it's quite toasty in here right now. It's like it's a little under 95 degrees. Didn't get that cold last night. So we're staying pretty warm in here. Over here, we've got the one tray we've started for spring. All our tomatoes are up. I think we got one sale there of German Johnson that didn't germinate. Everything else is up. We'll need to thin those in a minute. Our peppers haven't been all popping at the same time, but they're popping. Uh, we got 100% germination on that x3r red bell pepper there the cornito giallo sweet peppers they're coming along although a few cells are lagging behind and then i'm really excited about how well our hot peppers germinated i was a little bit worried about them because we had all those cool nights right after we planted them but 
Looks like all our Buena Mulatas germinated. Tabasco's did good. Big Jim did good. These Chiltapine, I think that's how you pronounce it, peppers, which are notoriously hard to germinate. We've got a few of those there. We don't need many plants of those, so we got enough of those. Our Daddle peppers here are germinated. These Pueblo chilies that a viewer sent us were the last ones to come up, but we're starting to get some of those popping there. So it looks like all of our peppers will have enough there for what we're going to do and plenty to give away. Really, really happy with that. On the other side of the greenhouse here where we have all of our fig trees propagate and we're starting to see some nice signs of life on some of these. Now from what I understand, every variety is a little different. Some varieties will root really quickly, others can take a couple months and that's kind of what we're seeing here. Now this one is the first one I did, this Canadria fig here and we've got some nice leaves on those guys. So this is the first one we did but this also seems to be a pretty fast rooting variety so i'm really liking what i'm seeing there tells me that my process that i use this year is working and i might start another tub of those since they're so fast and we were so successful with that variety i also understand some varieties are harder to propagate than others but it looks like this canadria is going to be a winner for us as far as propagation goes and this is a variety i really like so happy to have more of those trees so now that we've given all the tomato seeds we planted ample time to germinate, I don't think any more are going to pop. We need to thin these guys out. Now some people will try to save every single sprout here. They'll try to tease them apart, replant them in another pot. I'm really not interested in doing that. I just want one plant per cell here. I'm not trying to save every single little sprout. We've got plenty of plants here. Now as far as thinning them, some people will just pinch them or cut them off right at the soil level. But what I like to do is pull the whole plant out of there. Now you have to do this early or else you might disrupt the root system of the other seedling there. But if we do it early enough, like right now, and just gently kind of ease it out of there like that, we can get it out of there and I'll just chunk that. And now this one here has plenty of chance to grow. So if I've got multiple seedlings in a cell, I'll pick the best looking one or sometimes the one that's located more towards the center of the cell there. And we'll pull the rest of them out. That way we just have one per cell. So we got all the tomatoes thin. We'll do the same thing with the peppers here. Just thin these out to one plant per cell. Just kind of gently pull those out of there. And some people would say, it seems like you're wasting seeds by doing this, plant multiple seeds per cell and then just throwing away these seedlings the way i look at it it's not really worth with some of these seed packets costing just a few dollars it's not really worth me saving a seed packet trying to keep up with it when it's just got three or four or five seeds left in it so i'd rather just ensure i get a full tray of plants than trying to hang on to a seed packet with a few seeds in it so we usually if it's a seed packet of 30 seeds or so we just go ahead and plant the whole thing in here maybe plant a few doubles in the cells that way we get a full or somewhat of a full tray here and then we got plenty of plants don't have many skips in here and there's a closer shot of the true leaves that are now on some of these tomato plants so those are the first leaves the second set of leaves the true leaves there and once we start seeing them we can start fertilizing them so today we're going to get the rest of our tomatoes started. Most of these are determinate tomatoes, although there are a few indeterminates in here. And we also got to get our eggplant planted as well. So we've got the Georgia Streak tomatoes. We've got the Big Zach tomatoes, which are growing as a part of a big tomato growing competition with Eddie over at Poor Boy's Little Homestead. We've got, this is a free variety that they sent me with seeds and such with my order called early doll this is a determinate variety never grown it before but i figured hey i'll start a few of these we'll see what happens and then we've got our really high performing hybrids here our roadster our red snapper grand marshall we've got some rambler and thunderbird seeds in here which i'm really excited about trying the thunderbird is a brand new variety and then we've got our cherry tomatoes these torangina tomatoes which is like a sun gold but supposed to have a little more compact plant so i put my labels in here for the roadster and red snapper which are proven varieties for us i'm going to do three rows of those because 
we'll have a lot of people asking for tomato plants and I'd like to give them some that I know is going to work. For these newer varieties we haven't grown before, the Rambler, Grand Marshal, and Thunderbird. We'll just do a few rows on those. I think I am doing three rows on the Thunderbird. I'm excited about that one. And then for the other stuff over here, the cherry and the other indeterminates and the eggplant. Just one row of those because we'll only need a few plants. And with these hybrid tomato seeds that are a little more pricey, I do want to be careful with these. So I'm just going to put one seed per cell. These things usually germinate pretty good. And because the seeds are a good bit more expensive, I'm not just going to be throwing away seedlings like we did earlier with the more inexpensive varieties. So it just depends on how much the seeds cost, whether I will double plant sometimes or not. Now for these two varieties here, the Rambler and the Thunderbird, these are varieties that aren't really available on any retail seed sites online. These are more commercial varieties, determinate hybrid varieties. You can find them on some of the commercial websites like I think Seedway may have them, but they have a minimal quantity. You got to order like a hundred or a thousand seeds of some of them. They're supposed to be really good varieties. We were fortunate that somebody sent us some of these. So for these we have pelleted seeds, which I really prefer just because they're easier to plant, easier to handle. And so that's what the pelleted seeds look like there. And if you're planting pelleted seeds, you need to top water a little bit to wash that little clay pellet off there. The pelleted seeds always perform well for us. All right, so we got all those seeds in the cells there, and that's all the tomatoes. We've got all the peppers on the other tray. I'm only going to do this one variety of eggplant here. Unless a viewer or somebody sends me something, I've just got to try. That's pretty much all the tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant that we're going to grow. Most of these, we're just doing a few plants for variety. We'll give away the rest. Maybe some of these hybrids here we'll plant. I don't know five or six maybe a little bit more of each variety to do a fair trial and really be able to compare them now we just need to cover them up and of all the techniques we use in our greenhouse or gardens this is probably the one that gets the most questions people are really really curious about topping seeds with perlite here and i could spend a long time talking about why i like it but i would say if you have questions about it, just try it one time perlite's cheap you can give it a try. It's not going to cost you a lot to try it. Give it a try. See if you like it. I haven't talked to many people who didn't like it. Most everybody that tries it does like it. Just kind of helps those seedlings be able to pop through there. Helps with a lot of different things. So if you're curious, just give it a shot. But before we water those in, I want to show you something I got the other day that I'm really liking. So the water and wand we've been using in here is this little dram wand here. I think this is an 18 inch wand. And this is a nice one, it works pretty well. I've been using it for a long time. This is kind of the consumer grade dram wand. But I was on Greenhouse Mega Store the other day getting some stuff and I needed a little bit more to get free shipping. And I had seen somebody on Facebook, a market farm or something using one of these puppies right here. Now these come in several different lengths. I can't remember what size I have here, 30 inches. And so this is like this dram wand, so this is the commercial grade model and it's got a it's longer than this one obviously so i can kind of reach out to the end of the greenhouse a little better and i like this one a lot better i've just got a little better control of the flow of the nozzle here when i squeeze it so you can see it makes a nice little shower here so a nice little light shower for the plants and then we can also screw this off here And we can put our mist nozzle on there, our fogget nozzle here, if we want a real kind of delicate stream of water on those tiny little seedlings. I'll show you what that looks like. So we got a nice little mist there. I'll probably leave this one there for a little bit. It'll help me from overwatering those figs and help me from beating down these little transplants or these little seedlings that we have growing now. So we'll give them a nice little soak here with this mist nozzle. And now that most of the stuff in this tray has germinated, I'll probably take this off the mat soon. I could leave it on here, but I need this mat space to start something else. So we'll probably take this off and then we'll start something else in its place right here on this mat. Okay, so that takes care of our greenhouse duties for the day. 
and so far we're doing pretty good about staying on schedule with that seed starting schedule that we mentioned several videos ago but now we're out here in the garden and we need to take care of this plot right here we need to pull back this tarp we're going to amend it with some alfalfa pellets and basically get it ready for planting whenever that time comes probably looking at mid-march to the end of march but we want to go ahead and get it ready and that way all we have to do is pull back the tarp and plant when the time comes now in this allium plot behind me where we have onions and leeks planted, we've been putting down a good bit of alfalfa pellets here, but we've also been using some other fertilizers. So it's kind of hard to tease out the effects of the alfalfa pellets. So to really experimentally look at how well the alfalfa pellets do as a soil amendment and fertilizer, we should probably use it on a plot that we're not adding a ton of other stuff. So on this plot here, instead of adding more compost, we're going to add just alfalfa pellets. We'll probably still use our 855 Nature Safe in the fur row at planting, but after that, we'll just see how the plants do. And from that, we should be able to tell how effective the alfalfa pellets are in our soils. Now, on this onion plot here, I've been using the FRM brand of alfalfa pellets. I got them at a local feed and seed store. I think they're around 15 bucks for a big bag. We've had a lot of people asking, do you have to worry about herbicide contamination with alfalfa pellets and as far as I understand the research I've done you don't really have to worry about it but there are organic alfalfa pellets I'll show you some in a second that you can buy where you don't really have to worry about anything if there was anything to worry about to begin with so I was at Tractor Supply the other day and they didn't have that FRM brand but they had this Stan Lee brand of alfalfa pellets here and these are organic as you see here I think these were like 20 bucks a bag so a little more expensive than the FRM brand and I was actually on Stan Lee's website and they have a whole section on their website or a whole page on their website talking about how you can use these as a fertilizer and soil amendment in your garden so that's pretty cool now there's a good bit of information online about using alfalfa pellets in your garden as a fertilizer or as a soil amendment, but there's not a lot of information out there on how much you should actually use. From what I understand, the general nutrient analysis, I guess it could vary from one brand to the next, but from what I understand, it's a 2-1-2 analysis, so 2% nitrogen, 1% phosphorus and 2% potassium so not really nutrient rich so that means we need to put down a good bit of them and I'm going to put down both those 40 pound bags on this plot right here which is 30 by 35 that may be a little more than I need but I want to make sure I got enough we can really see how effective this is and like I said those bags are only 20 bucks a piece so we really haven't invested that much in experimenting to see how effective they are now it's pretty windy out here today you can see those trees blowing you can probably hear it on the microphone so i hope this doesn't turn into a disaster but what i want to do is just pull back this tarp i want to pull it back over that way i'm going to leave it pinned down on the end there pull it back so we can put these alfalfa pellets down and then i want to cultivate it one time to get those mixed into the soil and with the alfalfa pellets, which I've learned on this onion plot over here, you got to have some water to get those things to start breaking down. Thankfully, we're supposed to get some rain tonight and basically rain all day tomorrow. So that's why I think it's the perfect time to do this. We'll get the alfalfa pellets on here. We'll get them incorporated. We'll leave that tarp off, let it get some good rain tonight and tomorrow. Then we'll put the tarp back on it once it stops raining. So let me get this tarp off. Hopefully it doesn't turn into a kite. We'll put down those alfalfa pellets, we'll cultivate it, and we'll see what it looks like. Healed up pretty nicely there still got a little debris on that far end there but this is pretty much ready to plant especially if we're just putting transplants in here that little bit of chunky debris is not a problem it might cause some issues if we were direct seeding but uh i still think it'd be all right so we'll let this get a good soaking tonight and tomorrow get a lot of rain on it that'll help dissolve those alfalfa pellets help them start to break down 
Then once it's done raining, we'll put the tarp back on it and just let the tarp sit on it until the day when we're ready to plant. When you're doing this tarping technique, the last thing you want to do is pull back the tarp till it and then plant because then you're stirring up some weed seeds so we cultivate it which probably brings a few weed seeds to the top but since we're putting the tarp back on it those weed seeds will germinate and then die so that's a great way to kind of reduce your weed seed bank just don't pull the tarp off then till it then plant because you've introduced a lot more weed seeds to the surface that way and I haven't really figured out what we're going to plant here yet. I'm leaning towards planting our tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant here, but I haven't really decided, haven't really mapped out all the plots yet. We'll do that on an upcoming video. We'll kind of map out all 10 plots, talk about what's been there, what's been planted there in the last few years, and what we should plant there this year based on our rotation schedule. So this should be a fun little experiment here. We'll get to see just how effective these alfalfa pellets are. If you've used a lot of alfalfa pellets in your garden, let me know, do you think 40 pounds was not enough here, too much, or just right? Like I said, I haven't found really anything online that tells you how much you should use per square foot. And don't forget to go check out Wood Prairie for your seed potatoes. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can find all our other affiliate partners in the description below. Go check out our website, lazydogfarm.com. You can find a lot of our blogs there, recipes, and even some cool Lazy Dog Farm merch. If you did enjoy this video, make sure to subscribe, hit that notification button, like, and share. And we'll see you next time right here at Lazy Dog Farm. Oh. Well, mm -hmm. by the beauty of your life.